thank you Felicity and thank you for inviting me along today. It's good as a dietitian to have the opportunity to talk to so many speech pathologists and when I stand here there's lots of you out there. Um, so I'm Karen, I've worked as a dietitian with age and disability in home care for the last six years, um, although I've worked as a dietitian for a long time, um, especially in the disability field. Um, I also do small amounts of work with health, with palliative care and motor neuron disease, um, and I have a tiny private practice. Um, so I've worked in dysphagia management in lots of different settings over the years and worked with lots and lots of speech pathologists as well. Um, so it will be really good for me just to have the opportunity just to share those experiences with you today. Today I'm actually going to focus mainly on adults, um, but I'm really happy to take any paediatric questions that anybody might have towards the end. Okay, so I thought I'd make you feel all really guilty after you've had your um, lovely croissants and crunch through your fruit and your scones um, and just really start off um, yeah, with the first slide of a puree diet that probably doesn't meet the nutritional needs of somebody with dysphagia. Does anybody know what that one actually is? Any guesses? No? Beef stroganoff. It's, like, it's actually shepherd's pie, um, which is the one that actually shouldn't go too wrong, but I think most foods that we put in the blender can go wrong quite badly, quite quickly. Um, this, I put this slide up. Um, this slide reminds me of when I very first started um, working with disability and dysphagia in probably about 1993, which was a long time ago. And it was actually a, um, a very large group home for children back in the UK and there was about 10 to 15 um, children within that group home who had really quite significant needs. Um, we had one person at that time on a gastrostomy feed and it was kind of, you needed a puree diet or you didn't, there was no in between. Um, so this reminds me of the types of diets that these children used to have. And it wasn't a, a harmful thing, it was just that people didn't know. You know, it wasn't because people were being lazy or they couldn't be bothered, they just didn't understand what a modified consistency diet was. And in fact, the, the cook within that group home used to make um, quite nutritious vegetable soup and she used to use that soup to put in with things like fish and chips to make the puree because she thought she was doing the right thing and didn't know any better. Um, the speech pathologist and I at the time, we were really desperate to do some training and we were told the two of you need to go away work here for a few shifts, work some meal times, and then come back and do some training when you know actually how hard it is here. So I really learned from that first position that you know you, you need to be able to understand how difficult it is, it is for staff who work in group homes. Um, and also it must have, I was there for five or six years and it must have taken us the five or six years just to make any significant changes there. So, um, so that was my kind of hard lesson when I first started working in the disability field. Okay, and I'd like to say we never see that now, but unfortunately, we sometimes do, and we sometimes see worse. So, um, yeah. okay. <clears throat> So just to really quickly go through what I'm going to talk about today, so um, really to meet nutritional needs um, takes so much more than just nutrition. As we all know, it takes that huge team approach, lots of training, ongoing education, everybody working together, working with carers, working with the clients. It's a huge approach really um, to meet nutritional needs. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what food means to the person um, and how that change affects them. Um, obviously as a dietitian I'll talk about the nutritional impact of modified consistency diets um, and just special special considerations in the disability field. What do we, I think our skills in dysphagia, because I, I work in nursing homes, I work in hospitals, I work all over the place, the skills are quite interchangeable, but I think there are specific needs that we need to think about in disability. Um, and then I'm actually going to describe a project that we did in the Illawarra, a joint project between dietetics and speech pathology. Um, and I'm also going to talk about um, a case study just to highlight some of the, the dietetic needs and, and take that perspective on things. Okay. And I'm hoping at the end we'll have um, time for lots of questions or even in between because there's two quite distinct parts to the presentation. Okay. So I thought I would start off with, um, with a quote from Heston um, who says, 
Because eating is the only thing we do that involves all the senses. We eat with our eyes and our ears and our noses. You think about some of the most memorable meals you've ever had. The food will be good, but it will then be about locating a mental memory and taste is linked to all the other senses. When we think about modified consistency diets, then we've already lost the, the sight of the food. Sometimes we've lost the smell and quite often we've lost the taste. And if we put that into a really busy group home setting, we've often lost a lot of the elements of the things that we really enjoy about food. And sometimes it just takes one thing to put you off a meal. You know, we sometimes, um, my kids really like a restaurant and I won't say where, and I think it has a bit of a funny smell, so I don't like to go there. I can't describe what the smell is, but the food's really nice. The setting's really nice, but there's just something about the smell that I just don't like. So we don't go there very often because for me, it puts me off. Sometimes we'll have our, you know, if we're really hungry, we'll have our lunch put in front of us and think, oh, I don't like the look of that so much. But then you think, oh, well, it tasted OK, um, but you still don't really quite enjoy that whole experience. Um, so I think it's so important in dysphagia that we work hard um, to pull all of those experiences together and make mealtimes really pleasurable for people. Now, that's a lot easier said than done when we have busy settings, busy staff um, and people with really quite significant needs to look after as well. Okay. Does anybody know what that is, the picture of the food? Does anybody know what it's called? <coughs> it's actually called meat fruit. Now, I, as somebody who's worked in dysphagia for years, I kind of looked at um, some of the things that Heston Blumenthal had cooked, and I thought, that looks nice and soft. That would be perfect for a modified consistency diet to put on this slide. But then, actually, once the slide had gone off, I thought, I'll just have a little look and see what it is. And it's a really um, light, fluffy chicken liver patty mousse. And the orange around it is jelly. <laughs> So I thought probably if you're on a, a um, modified fluid, that's going to dissolve in your mouth completely and not the best thing. So it just shows, and it's that kind of thing that people go, oh, you know, I'll often see carers at home and they'll say, oh, it's great, we found this and we found that, and we're the health professional that then has to say, oh, you can't have that. It's like the homemade minestrone soup. People always make minestrone soup for somebody on a modified consistency diet, and we're the ones that then have to say, it's probably the worst thing. So, um, yeah. Okay. All right. <clears throat> but it would be nice if they all looked as nice as that, really. Okay. The next thing I really want to talk about is just the psychological effect of eating and drinking with dysphagia. As dietitians, we're taught really when we first see somebody, we have to think about the effect that changing their diet is going to have on them. How is that actually going to affect them psychologically? Um, now, in the disability world, we can see the depression, frustration, embarrassment, vulnerability, fear, anger, helplessness. We can often see that with our clients because they either just don't want to eat at all or we might see behaviours or lots of different things going on um, that tell us that something isn't quite right. That person is unhappy about th something and things have changed. We also see that in carers as well. We meet lots of carers who are are depressed and frustrated and you know angry about it they don't understand why this person has had to change their diet to a puree diet or a minced and moist diet um, we can overcome this a lot of the time by just good counseling before we even start um, <clears throat> so before that person's diet is about to change you know it's really important that they we can chat through with them the, the types of foods that they that they like how can we still make that a good diet for you with a modified consistency so really a lot of counseling before we even think about changing that diet um, is, is a really good way forward because it can help to them um, to sort of give some more understanding and it can help to ease a a lot of these feelings as well. Once that person's diet had started, I find it's then quite late to go back and st especially in my palliative care role, you know, if somebody's then is on a minced moist diet and they're feeling really quite upset and depressed about this, it's then hard to go back and just <coughs> say, well, what did you used to enjoy? Did you used to really like crunchy foods? Did you used to love a sandwich? Because it's actually a bit late in the day to do that because those feelings have already started. So I think just to be really aware, and as dietitians, we need to be really aware as well um, that by changing somebody's diet, it doesn't matter how small, um, it can actually really change the way they feel about the food and just affect the, their whole being and their whole um, their health, really, at the end of the day. 
Okay. I thought what I would do is uh, there's um, a few fairly recent um, studies looking at um, some perspectives on modified consistency diets. Um, so this one actually looks at, I, I really like research that tells us how people feel. Um, this one is really looking at the difference between uh, acute and chronic care, but I think some of the perspectives are still really quite interesting. Um, so things like I'm picking up my foods differently because some are harder to chew, so I'm eliminating some that I should be eating. We see this all the time. We see this quite a lot when we work um, in the disability field that people will suddenly start to not eat certain foods because they're finding them more difficult. We see it with children quite often. They're finding them more difficult to manage, more difficult to chew. And when I work with motor neuron disease, we quite often do that initial visit to see somebody and maybe they're saying, oh, you know, I've, we don't really have nuts anymore. We don't have chips anymore. I'm enjoying things that have got lots of gravy on them. So quite often people will do this natural self-protecting elimination of foods. And it's also a cue that there's something amiss. There's something not quite right. Um, other sort of um, perceptions, but every once in a while it would hit me and I'd start to choke. I'd get sneezing attacks, therefore we'd get the food out of my nose. It's kind of embarrassing. I don't like to go out to dinner. Um, so we see lots of people who don't want to go out to dinner anymore, um, partly because it's embarrassing, it's, it's difficult, it's too hard, and also because there's sometimes not a lot of foods on the menu people can actually have. I once did a, um, a dysphagia training day, and we did it in a hotel, and we decided as part of the day that we would all try and choose a modified consistency lunch from the menu, and there was, there was absolutely nothing. I think there was minestrone soup that nobody could have. And I think we all ended up with lasagna and we had to take the crunchy bit off the top. The delicious bit had to come off the top and we were left with kind of picking out mushrooms that were a bit hard. There was actually absolutely nothing. And I don't know if anybody here has taken people out for, for lunch or for dinner um, when they have swallowing issues and trying to find something on the menu unless you pre-book is really, really difficult. Um, and it's if we go back to the, the Heston quote, it's important that people can go to places that they want to go to to be able to eat and drink. I went to a group home the other day and somebody was really excited because they were going out for Chinese. And she said to me, oh, we're going in, it's by the water and the restaurant's like this. And she didn't mention the food. It wasn't about the food. It was actually about going into the restaurant and the restaurant was beside the water and how it felt and how it looked. Um, so it's a big, big thing for people when they can't go out to dinner anymore. Um, we also have lots of carer stress over modified consistency diets, so how would you know what to give to keep strength if they got to the point they couldn't manage solids? And then also you can last for food without you can last without food for a while, but coughing and choking is right then. You can't breathe. It's certainly not the way I want to die. That's awful. It's a really it's really scary if somebody and a speech pathologist you all know this, if somebody's had one choking episode, it's a really scary thing to think that they might have it again. And some more perspectives, um, as you can see, I, I really, it, I feel if I know how people think or how carers think before we start to do something, then it helps us actually make the right choices for that, help that person to make the right choices. Um, so some more perspectives, and this was from a, a study that you should read um, from last year, um, that actually is talking about perceptions when people have been, you know, when the, when the diet has been changed, how they actually feel. Um, so it's horrified, frustrated, upset, depressed, down in the dumps, confronting, and it's a big loss to people. Um, and then this one from a care worker, and we hear this stuff all the time, that he loved his food, one day choked on a bit of chicken and was downgraded to minced moist. He became very sad and depressed because he felt like this was his right to eat his normal food and this was taken away from him. He was really, really down in the dumps. And again, it's that counselling before we see people explaining to carers, explaining what's happening and why it's important. Um, I eat because I don't want to lose any more weight. I eat because I have to, but I'm not enjoying this. People feel like that all the time when they're on modified consistency diets. And the other one and said, oh, she's minced moist. I was very upset about it and asked why. We tend to do this. I, I sometimes do it. You know, we put labels on people and I'll say, well, who was that? Oh, that was the puree or that was the minced moist. That's the person who's on the soft. And it's kind of forgetting that this is really huge for that person. Um, so I've seen a couple of people go from normal food to modified. There's no slow change to it. It's just boom, one day it's normal and the next they're like, where's my food? 
Um, and the other thing, I put a lot of salt and pepper and tomato sauce or anything I can find to disguise or give it taste because it's got no taste. Um, and I know you've been doing some work yesterday um, about how to make food more exciting and give it more taste and I'll touch on that a little bit again today. So that's just a bit of background really that just as dietitians I guess so you know where we're coming from just how we think about how people feel when there's any sort of dietary change. All right you've probably touched on this a little bit yesterday as well but I thought I would just talk about the whole food appearance from a dietetic perspective. Um, because it, it's kind of be slightly different depending on the, the take you have. Um, so very much that smell of the food, especially if you work in a hospital, when often the food will come and it will have a, a it will um, be covered. It's usually a plastic cover on it, and when that cover's lifted, a mod modified consistency food can have a little bit of an odd smell. I don't know if anybody's noticed that, especially the prepackaged stuff. And again, it's it's a, and if people if things smell bad, we don't want to eat it. It's naturally a very protective thing that we do. Um, if it's got a bad smell, we, we just don't want it. And that's sort of I will some times, especially at my very small role at Port Kembla Hospital, I will sometimes go in and see people when that diet's coming and I'll say, okay, let's, and we'll have a little chat about it and we'll say, oh, it's actually quite nice if you taste it, it's fine, just to get over those psychological barriers to that food. Um, the texture of food, some people, it will be a much bigger change than others. So some people like a naturally soft diet. My 16-year-old son loves shepherd's pie and puree fruit and custards and things. I actually don't think he would notice if I said, you're not going to go into a soft diet. I don't think it would make any difference to him. Some people, though, love a crunch. They love their salads and their salad sandwiches and their crunchy fruit and vegetables and chips and tortillas and all of these things a lot of people really love that crunch in their diet so somebody especially working in disability services somebody who perhaps has has just loved that sensory crunch to food to then to put them onto a soft diet is going to be a much larger change and nutritionally it's going to be have a much bigger impact on that person to somebody who just liked a soft diet in the first place um, and it's just that thinking about that psychologically and that emotional um, and, and that nutritional change that people are going to have. Okay. So the taste of food, um, we don't really want people from a health point of view to have to add loads of salt to food um, to actually give it some taste and this sometimes happens with our modified consistency diets as well. Um, and I think you probably did this yesterday, it's about working quite hard with a lot of our flavourings and spices and, and, and different flavours just, just to make the food more exciting. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can get, especially in a, a sort of group home situation, situation um, we can get very much into um, our kind of white sauces, cheese sauces, gravies, it's what we use all the time to most, melt moist in food and it becomes really, really dull. So it's kind of moving away from that um, kind of cheesy, saucy, gravy type flavour to other things. I have one client who's actually um, at home and he's a really, really good cook and he will often um, maybe roast, do that kind of roast his lamb overnight in the oven so it's just falling apart the next day and he hates cheese sauce, white sauce, gravy, he doesn't like meals like that at all. So he'll then add yogurt and sour cream and he'll peel and skin tomatoes and maybe just add a little bit of garlic and things and then make a sort of um, pureed salsa and add that and then he does lots of really good inventive things just to give that food a great taste and just to make it taste just a bit more like him. Um, that variation of food that we would have every day so it's thinking about and also from a dietetic point of view the more taste that people have the more nutrients they're having so from a nutritional point of view it's hard sometimes we, I'll, I'll talk about this just in a second sometimes with modified consistency diets we have a very similar taste and a lot of the foods are very um, fortified and very cheesy and it tends to be that there's kind of cheese at every single meal time so it's good to think about slightly different things um, visuals and colour, 
obviously from um, from our point of view, it's that sort of corny, you have to eat a rainbow on your plate type of thing. Um, so we are still looking for that rainbow. And when I do the nutritional analysis, you'll see why. Um, but it's really, really difficult with modified consistency diets to get those vegetables right. And we often see plates that look a little bit like my initial picture of the puree <coughs> diet. So um, we really need the visuals. The more colours we have on our plate, the more vitamins and the more minerals and nutrients that we will tend to have there. Okay, um, and temperature, it's just again trying to keep food hot um, because from a food safety point of view, I don't know if anybody's watched a feeding assessment when somebody has, you know, they're taking maybe half an hour, three quarters of an hour to eat the, their dinner and that, that bowl is going in and out of the microwave all the time and it's a food safety risk um, and it's also just depleting the nutrients every time you reheat, we deplete nutrients. So. Um, so it's, it's a lot to think about. Um, so between thinking about the, the whole appearance of food and then thinking about how that food affects a person, it's a huge amount to think about in, when people are caring for others and in that sort of busy working day as well. Okay. So now I've done a bit of background. I thought it would actually be good just to think about the nutrition and what happens to diets as we um, as we modify them. Now I'll go through the sort of dif different consistencies and we'll look at how it changes really through graphs that compare our nutrition with our dietary reference values. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole um, Australian Guide to Healthy Eating and talk about each food group and what people need because I'm guessing that most people know that anyway. Um, okay. And we'll just talk a little bit as well about the consequences of, of that modification of, of diet and how it goes on. <coughs> 